بسم الله والحمد لله وأصلي وأسلم على المبوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So we're continuing our commentary to the poem on Islamic morals and manners by the humble scholar Ibn Abi Al-Qawi Al-Mardawi rahmatullah alayhi. And we're still on chapter dealing with salam and the various issues linked to greeting. And in the last session, we had talked about the issue of kissing while giving salam, while greeting someone. And we said it's permissible, and actually perhaps even recommended it at, in the view of some scholars, to kiss the forehead, the hands, even the feet of someone who is respected or held in honor and respect for religious reasons. It's established, we mentioned, that the Sahaba would kiss the hands and the feet of the Messenger, وسلم, but not by way of habit on occasion. And it's established that the Messenger of Allah himself kissed some of his Sahaba when, when meeting them after coming back from a journey. And it's established that the Salaf would do so to each other as well. So as a principle it is perfectly permissible to uh, kiss uh, another person while greeting them on the forehead, on the hands, on the feet even, uh, as, a, as a mark of respect and honour for that individual. We also mentioned that it is recommended, generally speaking, for us to kiss our children. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa regarded it to be uh, a case where Allah has stripped the, his mercy from someone who does not kiss his children or her children. Uh, and also we discussed the issue of hugging when greeting. And we talked about uh, when it was sunnah to hug while greeting, the sunnah occasions of hugging. And was anybody here from in the last session? Okay, so uh, we mentioned that a, the sunnah occasions were when you're returning from a journey or when you haven't seen someone for a long time or just as a, as a, you know, as a sign of extreme joy or love at meeting someone, a spontaneous act of, of joy and love at meeting someone. We said these were the sunnah occasions or recommended occasions, otherwise the act of hugging becomes one of permissibility. Otherwise the act of hugging becomes one of permissibility. It's perfectly allowed. But we cannot say that it is a sunnah to hug or as a general, as a norm. And we also mentioned that it shouldn't be made into a norm anyway. It shouldn't be made into a habit anyway. But as a principle, it is permissible to hug when greeting. It should not be made into a habit. But there are certain occasions where the sunnah has actually, where the Messenger of Allah has actually legislated or sunnah has actually stated you should hug on, or you can hug or you should hug on these occasions. Coming back from a journey, after meeting someone from a long time, and also just to express you know, the spontaneous act of joy and love for an individual. So for example, it's permissible, perfectly permissible, to hug on occasions of celebration like Eid. It's not, it's not reported from the Salaf as a practice that they would do. So we don't, we don't say it's a sunnah to hug on these occasions, but the permissibility remains. But the permissibility remains to, to, do, to do so on, on these occasions. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll be, we'll be completing the chapter on Salam, and we covered, as I said, a lot of things, a lot of issues in the previous sessions. Five, six, seven sessions we talked about just around the Salam. And we talked about the um, uh, issue of shaking hands, and the author, Rahmatullah, is mentioning some of the dislike matters. And he mentioned, وَنَّزْعُ يَدٍ مِمَّنْ يُسَافِهُ عَجِلًا And to, if you like, snatch your hand away after having shook, while, you know, after extending it to... Um, to shake someone's hand, he says to quickly snatch it away is disliked. Is quickly is, is disliked. And likewise, the scholar mentioned that you know shaking hands with like with just a fingertip touching like this or these these sort of things. These are disliked. They're like the disliked actions. Why? Because they are like sh uh, signs of ostentation. To like shake hands with just the tips of the finger that some people do, or, like just a few, just grab the fingers of oh, somebody else's hand. When we shake hands, it should be a full handshake, hand to hand, and it's disliked to remove or snatch your hand away quickly if you're the one who started the handshake, if you're the one who started the handshake. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, provided, explaining this, this, this ruling, provided that you think that the other person will soon remove his hand. Otherwise, you're stuck in this perpetual handshake, by the way, when one person's just, nobody's removing their hand. So where you think the other person will soon, you know, push his hand back and end the handshake, then it's actually disliked for you to actually be the first to Remove, stop the handshake if you initiated a handshake. But otherwise, um, you should, you, uh, if you think that the person is just not going 
drop his hand at all, then it's perfectly permissible to drop your hand. Um, and the next issue li linked to greeting is if you're, you come to, and to a gathering and there's a gathering happening and you, and you greet. And now some of the rulings about gatherings themselves and what should happen in the gathering. So we have, uh, he said, that a group of people talking privately or talking amongst themselves, excluding one of their number. A group of people are sitting down and they're all having a conversation and they exclude one of the number. This is disliked. This is disliked at the very least. Uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا كُنْتُمْ ثَلَاثَةً فَلَا يَتَنَاجِي رَجُلَانِ دُونَ الْآخَرِ حَتَّى تَخْتَلِتُ بِالنَّاسِ مِنْ أَجْلِ أَنْ يُحْزِنَهُ That when you are three people sitting together, no two of you should be speaking privately, excluding the third person, until other people turn up and start talking to him for God. Because why? This will grieve him. This will upset him. So you can, if you can imagine three people sitting together and two are just having this private hushed conversation and the third one's been excluded, he's going to be feel left out. He's going to feel grieved. And he might even start thinking, they're talking about me. Yeah. They're talking, this, they're whispering things about me. He might even start thinking that I'm not good enough for these people. You know, they think that I'm beneath them. They're not talking to me. He starts having negative thoughts about his brothers in Islam. Right? So to, to prevent this possibility of grieving and harming our brother in Islam or sister in Islam, the Messenger of Allah prohibited this action, or at the very least made it disliked. That when we're sitting, when three people are sitting, two of them should not be having their own conversation privately to the exclusion of the third. Likewise, any number of, any number of people sitting, none of them should be having a conversation together to the exclusion of one of their number. For the same reason, it will upset him, it will disturb him, yeah. it will harm him effectively. In another hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يتناجى إثنان دون الثالث No two people should be having a private conversation excluding the first. فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ يُؤْذِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Because this upsets the believer. This upsets the believer. وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَكْرَهُ أَذَا الْمُؤْمِنِ And Allah dislikes a believer being harmed or upset. Allah dislikes that a believer be upset. So, uh, one time, uh, <coughs> that, uh, it's mentioned that I and Ibn Umar were in a particular place and they were talking. And a man came and alone and he wanted to have a private conversation with Abdullah ibn Umar. So there's, Abdullah ibn Umar is already talking to somebody else and a third person comes. And so Ibn Umar calls another person, making them four. And then he goes and has this private conversation with this person and the other two keep talking amongst themselves. The point being, this is exactly, this is the way of the Salaf. They understood the Sunnah of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. And when this person was surprised at what Ibn Umar had done, he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying that no two people should speak to the exclusion of a third. No two people should be speaking to the exclusion of the third. And extending this, they said that the same ruling applies where a group of people are speaking in a language that the other person will not understand. The same ruling, right? Because the same thing will happen if he feel upset, he might feel aggrieved, right? So say, you know, whatever, they're speaking French or Spanish or even Arabic, right? But the other person doesn't understand this language. They shouldn't be speaking in that language, excluding him from that conversation. وَإِنْ يَجْلِسَ الْإِنسَانُ عِنْدَ مُحَدِّثٍ بِسِرٍ وَقِيلَ حُضُرْ وَإِنْ يَأْذَنْ وَإِنْ يَأْذَنْ وَإِنْ يَأْذَنْ يَقُعْدِي And it is uh, disliked for a person to sit amongst people who are speaking in a hushed voice. So if he's coming, he's come along and there's a group of people or one or two people sitting and they're speaking in a hushed voice amongst themselves. This is an indication, this is already a private conversation. Yeah. He shouldn't intrude on that conversation. You shouldn't intrude on that conversation. Unless, unless they give him permission. 
unless they give him permission, he can sit with him. And some scholars said this is haram for him to do. This is haram for him to do. Why? Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ اسْتَمَعَ إِلَى حَدِيثِ قَوْمٍ وَهُمْ لَهُ كَارِهُونَ أَوْ يُفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ سُبَّ فِي أُذْنِهِ الْآنُكْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That uh, whoever listens into the conversation of some people, and it's clear it's a private conversation, and they don't want him to listen into it, or they move away from him when he's trying to listen into their conversation, then molten lead will be poured into his ears on the day of resurrection. Molten lead will be poured into his ears on the day of resurrection. Because of this hadith, and because this hadith links it to the direct punishment on the day of judgment, a group of scholars made this action haram. They regard it to be haram. That if you come across a group of people, and it's clear they're having a private conversation, then don't intrude unless you're given permission. Otherwise, it's regarded like a case of spying. And we know that spying is prohibited in Islam. Again, one time Abdullah bin Umar is having a clearly private conversation with another individual. And a third person intrudes amongst him, enters and sits down with him. And so Abdullah bin Umar hits him in his chest and pushes him away. And he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, two people, are, when two people are having a private conversation, then the third person cannot enter amongst them or intrude that conversation with, on that conversation or in that conversation without their permission. Illa bi idnihuma, without their permission. So this is linked to greetings. So generally people coming in and they're seeing these, these, these gatherings of people or, or gatherings of people already sitting down and having these conversations. And linked to this is the fact that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that al majalisu bil amana that gatherings are an amana, are a trust. Meaning by this that by default, by default, the gathering is regarded to be a private matter. I.e. if you have a gathering, people have talked, and then the gathering ends, it's regarded to be an amana, meaning you don't spread what was discussed in that gathering. Right. It's, a, it's a trust. Unless, of course, and the reason why is to, to, to prevent this is why? Prevent namima, to do, close the door of tail gathering, gossiping, etc. This is the reason behind it. Al majalit bin amana. Unless, of course, there was nothing uh, private discussed in that gathering. It's, it's just jokes, for example, right? And if it's harmless to actually spread or tell other people what's talked, discussed in that gathering, and you know it, I mean, every adult person here is sensible and knows what's, what's harmless and what's harmful, what's private, what isn't private. We can make that judgment for ourselves. If we understand that what was discussed in that gathering was harmless, then it's okay to tell other people. But otherwise, the default ruling is that the gathering is uh, a trust. The gathering is a trust. إِذَا حَدَّثَ الرَّجُلْ بِالْحَدِيثِ ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ فَهِيَ أَمَانًا The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that one person has a conversation with another person and then he leaves. This is one understanding of this hadith. And then he leaves. Then that conversation becomes an amana. Conversation becomes a trust, it becomes a private issue. Unless, again, of course, you know there's nothing serious discussed there, it's harmless. In another understanding of this hadith, and it's another layer of meaning, if you like, is that a man is talking to you, and while he's talking, he's looking left and right, right, making sure there's nobody else in the vicinity in this, hearing that conversation. They said this is a clear indication now, he's giving you indications that he doesn't want other people to know about this conversation. Therefore, definitely, this becomes an amana. If there's indications from the other individual that this conversation he wanted treated as private, then immediately it becomes an amana. Right? Even if it was harmless, you cannot disclose what was discussed to anybody else because he's indicated to you this is an amana. Right? Unless he explicitly now says, okay, fine, you can, you, can, you can tell other people about this. So the point being here is, and it's something that many of us are not aware of, is that majalis, gatherings, where we have conversations, are generally regarded to be a man. They are a trust. And we are required as believers to maintain that trust. Unless, and if there's an indication definitely that there is, this was a private conversation, definitely we cannot pass that information on. Um, the only exception to this, as I said, is when we understand that there was nothing you know, private discussed in that gathering, 
and to pass on you know, to tell other people about what was talked about in that gathering would be harmless and wouldn't harm any other individual. Uh, amana is something which is part and parcel of our iman. It is part and parcel of our iman. La imana liman la amana talahu. In the Muslim of Ahmad, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the one who cannot keep his trust has no iman. La imana liman la amana talahu. That the one who cannot keep his trust, things that he's entrusted with, there's no iman for that individual. Wala dina liman la ahda lahu. And there's no religion for the one who does not keep his promises, who cannot keep his promises. So, amana is part and parcel of our iman, and it is an integral part of our iman. And it's to be found, or is acted upon in every single limb that we have. There's the amana of the eyes, what our eyes have seen. The amana of our ears, what our ears have heard, which is what we're talking about in these gatherings. There's the amana of the tongue, what our tongue speaks and utters. The amana of the hand and the foot and the stomach and the private parts, all of these have an amana. All of these we're required to keep and upkeep as part and parcel of our faith. And uh, this is why actually the amana is so important that even a salaf, like again Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, used to say that if you want to judge the integrity of a person, if you want to judge the integrity of a person, don't look to his prayer. And don't look to his fasting, but look to what he says. Look to the truthfulness of his speech, and look to the and and, and check: is he someone who keeps his trusts, and is he someone who keeps his promises? So, if you want to find out about the integrity of an individual, don't look to the fact that he's praying five times a day, don't look to the fact that he's fasting on the month of Ramadan, but look at what he says and see if he is truthful in what he's, when he speaks. Look at the trusts he is entrusted with. Does he keep those trusts? Does he keep the amana? And does he break his promises? Is he a person who breaks his promises? So gatherings as a default ruling, if you like, are by amana. They are of trust. And we as part and parcel of our iman are regarded to or required to keep that amana, keep that trust. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, the narration you just mentioned about don't look at his prayers, don't look at his fasting, is the caveat that that person, the individual, by the must, be must pray, must, must pray. be fasting. So the be. one who says, oh, so the one who sees that and says, oh, the one who doesn't pray, he doesn't fast, but he keeps his secrets, uh, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. Yeah, the Sahaba, I mean, they uh, amongst themselves, none of them didn't pray. Right, this was like a default given. Right? What they're saying is that that in itself isn't. Uh, an indication of integrity in all circumstances. But truthfulness and the keeping in a manner is more of an indication. Because right. how many people do we know who pray five times a day but you know, break their promises and break their word and lie and uh, what is it? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going back to what you covered last week. You mentioned kissing uh, the feet of someone mm. as respect. How do you go about that without looking like you know, you're worshipping them or like bowing down to them, etc.? How would, you, how would you go about kissing someone's feet, like a, a scholar or a grandparent, etc.? You, you can do so by just, you know, lowering, lowering your back and, and, and going... I mean, you, you can do so without actually going into a, a, a posture of prostration, yeah. quite simply, right? That's like kneeling down. Yeah, like kneeling down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Sahaba did so with the messenger, at least, when he kissed his feet, on occasion. Yeah. yeah. Well, if they're talking about, like, something like serious, but you have to keep your trust in the night you can't tell anyone. Say that again, sorry? So, let's say you're telling somebody like, they're doing something that's wrong and you, know, you should tell someone about it, but you have to keep your trust anyway. So you can't tell anyone. No, so if the person is doing something wrong, then that overrides this ruling. Okay. So that wrong, the, the enjoining the good and prohibiting the evil must be done, and it overrides these things. How you do that, of course, you, um, uh, depending is, is done by case by case uh, scenario, right? So um, you don't necessarily have to broadcast it the whole world that he's doing something wrong. You could tell him he gets some new authority to and speak to that individual to speak to him, etc. You don't have to broadcast it to everybody and you know humiliate that individual. Right. And especially in today's world, I think it's very dangerous to do that because effectively, when you do that to that uh, to people, there's so many other avenues they can go down 
uh, of evil, and so many people welcoming them with open arms. You don't want to you don't want to push them down those avenues by openly humiliating them, etc. Right. So it's, it's safer, I think, nowadays to make sure it has to be corrected without a doubt to do it privately or to get someone else involved. But again, as a private sort of endeavour. Yeah. Is it seen as someone breaking it in the manner? For example, if you tell me in private, in trust, I'm buying a new house, right? And I go home and I tell my mum, oh, by the way, I brought Mrs. buying a new house. I broke your trust, and then I've said to you, oh, by the way, can I tell, can I tell my mother? And then you say, okay, well, I've done this after I've broken the trust. I've done so as I said, there's, 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 when you're having that, that convert, that private discussion, then the default ruling is that it's, it's, um, it's a namana. Unless you believe that it's harmless to tell somebody. Yeah. That's what I've said, right? Harmless to tell someone. Uh, or a, but if there's an indication that I've, I've like looked at, I've given an indication that this is private information, then definitely you can't, you cannot tell. So but otherwise, if you feel it's harmless to tell, then, then it's okay, inshallah. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah. Uh, with that, we conclude the chapter on the salam. And the next chapter is actually Babu Sirat al Rahim or Sirat al Arham, uh, joining the ties of kinship. Joining the ties of kinship. And when we talk about sila or joining or maintaining the ties of kinship, it means showing ihsan, showing excellent or the best behavior towards our near relatives. And arham or relatives that are determined by any, uh, all our relations through our parents. So who are our relatives? Everybody through our parents. Yeah, that can be quite, there's quite a large circle of people, but that's relatives for example. And therefore the immediate ihsan that needs to be shown is to our parents of course. Right? That's the immediate ihsan. And then all the other relatives we have who are relations to our parents, they are also required to be shown ihsan. And the greater right is on those who are closer to us in, rel in, in relations. The further the relations, the less rights that they have. But generally speaking, all of the relatives must be shown ihsan, and it's an obligation to do so. And so we know, I'm sure we know that, uh, after our obligation to Allah, and after our obligation to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest obligation we have is towards our parents. The greatest obligation we have is towards our parents. There's no human being, no living creature, that has an obligation upon us as greater than our parents after the Messenger And this is why you find that in the Quran repeatedly Allah, Allah mentions the obligation of being good to our parents after the obligation of worshipping Allah not committing shirk with him. وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْءَ Allah says, in, Allah says in, um, Worship Allah and do not associate any partners with him. وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْءَ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا and then right after this, Allah says, and be good to your parents. And be good to your parents. And to those who are your close relatives. And to the orphans. And to the poor. And your neighbor who is close and your neighbor who is distant. Uh, and to the travelers, in, uh, to the neighbors near and far. And to the travelers in, uh, in need. And what your right hands possess. And so you find this uh, over and over again in the Quran. That your Lord has decreed that only He should be worshipped and that you be good to your parents. We took the covenant with the Bani Israel. Don't worship anyone besides Allah. And be good to your parents. Uh, I say, come, I will tell you what Allah has made haram for you. Say to them, come, I will tell you what Allah has made haram for you. Allah tushriku bihi shay'a. That you do not commit shirk with Allah. And that you have to be good to your parents. Yeah, there's repeated many, many verses in the Quran like this. So, uh, and even if our parents are non-Muslims, the obligation still is there for us to be dutiful and good to our parents. The only time we, are, we can disobey them is when they tell us to disobey Allah or when they enjoin us to, towards committing shirk. 
And in this respect, we have the story of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the great companion of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. And he, we know, is coming from a very rich family. And he spends his days making and repairing bows and arrows. And he's somebody who's very close to his parents, especially to his mother. And at the age of 20, at the hands of Abu Bakr, he accepts Islam. And this enrages his mother. This enrages his mother. It makes a messenger of Allah very, very happy, but enrages his mother. And she, and then start, problems start happening between Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and his mother. And, you know, there's tensions. But he's still doing his utmost to maintain, be good to her. But then she starts, she makes a vow. Uh, and she vows that I will not eat and I will not drink until you leave Islam. I will not eat and I will not drink until you leave Islam. Even if it means I die. And she says to him that if I die, your heart will break. Your heart will break. And your people will rebuke you forever because they will say you are the person who killed your mother. And her argument to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is that you claim that your Lord has ordered you to obey your parents and to be good to them. And I'm your mother and I'm commanding you to do this. I leave Islam. And so uh, uh, Sa'd is begging his mother over and over again, don't do this. Eat. He's trying to, he's bringing food to her, he's bringing water to her, trying to make her eat. But three days pass, no food, no water. And she's becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. And uh, until she actually collapses. She collapses out of hunger and thirst. And it's another one of her sons, Umara, who actually forces her to drink. And then she regains consciousness. And immediately she, she starts cursing her son, Sa'ad ibn Waqqas. She starts cursing him. And you can imagine, you know, somebody you're very close to, your mother, going through something like this. The son going through this and the mother going through this as well. It can be very, very difficult. But all this time, Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas, he didn't ever compromise his iman. He never gave up on his imam. He never gave up on trying to be good to his mother. He never tried, gave up trying to feed his mother and give water to his, to his mother. But he also never gave up, gave up on his imam. And finally he says to her that my mother, in spite of my strong love for you, and my love for Allah and his messenger is greater. I love you, you're my mother. But my love for Allah and my messenger is greater than my love for you. And by Allah, he says, if you had 1,000 souls, and one after another these souls departed, meaning they died, one after another. You died 1,000 times, effectively. I would still not abandon my religion. If you died in front of my face 1,000 times, I would still not abandon my religion. And it's only after he said this that she really finally realized, his mother finally realized that he would not give up Islam. And only after this did she start eating and drinking again normally. And it's in response to this that Allah revealed two ayat in the Quran, two verses in the Quran. The first ayah in Ankabut, Sutul Ankabut, Wawasayna al Insana bi Walidaini Husna. We have instructed man to be good to his parents. Wa in jahadaka li tushrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilm falatuta But do not obey them if they strive to make you serve others besides me, of which you have no knowledge. Ilayya marji ukum fa unabi ukum bi ma kuntum ta'amalum. You will return to me and I shall inform you of what you have done. And the second I was in Luqman. That if they strive to make you associate partners with me, commit shirk with me, for which you have no knowledge, do not obey them in this. Yet despite this, keep their company in this life in the best of ways. So here is a powerful ayah, the last saying that if your parents are trying to make you commit shirk, and this is the worst sin possible, the greatest insult to Allah. So trying to make you do this. Don't obey them in this, but still be good to them. But still be good to them. Right. We have Muslim parents, right? Many, many of us, most of us, all of us sitting here are Muslim parents. They don't want to make us commit shirk with Allah. Anything as bad as this. Right. Allah is saying this is the worst sin possible, but still I require you to be good to your parents. What about anything less than that? Our parents might have shortcomings, but definitely not going to be caused telling us to commit shirk with Allah, worshipping other gods besides Allah. The duty we have towards our parents is great. Yeah. Be good to them in this world. Be good to them in this world. As I said, the greatest rights that 
a human being has is, is the parent, when it comes to humans, is, is the parents. Why is this? Because, and even if they're not Muslim, why is this? Because if you think about it, there are parents who have been there throughout our lives, right? laughing with us, crying with us, helping us, supporting us. Even if you don't realize it, they've always been there for us. Yeah. We may not recognize it, we may not realize it, but they are there. You know, our mother's carrying us for nine months in her stomach, got enduring the pain of pregnancy, the, 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 the difficulties that come after pregnancy, giving birth, etc. All of that they bore, bringing us up, keeping us safe, and never once expecting anything in return. Yeah. Never once uh, ever expecting anything in return. This is our parents for us. <coughs> and it's our moral duty as well. It's actually a moral duty and a religious duty. For us, as a result, to be grateful to our parents for everything they've done for us. Uh, and one of the things is that as our parents grow older and older, uh, it's easy, it becomes easier actually to forget the duty we have towards them. Especially in the society we're living around us, you know. The way of the people around us is to put their parents in care homes and visit them once a month or once a, month, uh, once a year even. Like, just go and visit them and think they've done a duty towards them. This is the way of the people around us. The opposite is due, the opposite is expected of us as Muslims. There is no way that a Muslim should be putting his or her parents in a care home. The duty we have towards our parents grows as they grow older and weaker and more needy. The duty we have towards them increases as they grow older and weaker and more needy. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that your Lord has decreed that only He should be worshipped. And to be good to your parents. That if one of them or both of them reach old age while you are still alive, then don't even say the slightest word of reproach. Don't even say oof to them. And do not be harsh with them. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا But speak gently with them. وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاهَ الظُّلْمِ And lower, take them under your wing, out of mercy. وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاهَ الظُّلْمِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Take them under your wing, out of mercy. وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحْمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا And say, Lord, show mercy to them as they did to me when they were looking after me, when I was small. Lord, show mercy to, to them as they did when I was small showed mercy to me, as they showed mercy to me when I was small. And in this ayah, Allah SWT specifically has mentioned the state of old age. Old age. When they reach the old, when they get old, then don't even say the slightest word of reproach to them. Why is this? Because as the, the older our parents get, the more irritable they get. It's just natural, right? They get more irritable. They may say, you know, they may become more short with you, they may be, speak to you loudly or harshly, etc. But you understand that this is because of old age, right? And so don't allow the, the way they're speaking to you to even in your irritation say the slightest word of irritation back to them. Right? And why does Allah in this ayah talk about the old age and then link it to the fact that they looked after us when we were young? Right? Why is there this link between us, Allah telling us in their old age don't be irritable towards them and then he links it to the fact that they looked after us when we were young. Because when we we're kids, we're, exactly the, we're very similar in temperament to people when they become old. Easily irritable, right? asking lots of questions, easily annoyed, right? speaking shortly, speaking rudely, speaking without thought. Right? That's us as young kids. And our parents, Allah is reminding us, they brought us up with mercy, even despite the fact that we were like this towards them. Right? Allah is saying, gonna be, there's going to be a time when they're going to become like you used to be as they get older. Don't allow that. Remind, remember, and at that point, remember how they were towards you when you were little babies as well, when you were little kids. It's an amazing ayah if you think about it. And this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Rida Rabbi fi Rida al-Walid, wa sakhatu Rabbi fi sakhat al-Walid. That the pleasure of the Lord lies in the pleasure of the parents. If your parents are happy with you, Allah is happy with you. And the wrath, the anger of the Lord, lies with the anger of the parents. If the parents are angry with you, Allah is angry with you. What do you have to So, we're going to talk about the details of maintaining entire kinship, with our, the obligation of our parent, towards our parents, in the verses of the poem that come in the coming sessions. But as an introduction, also we talk about, generally speaking, the ties of, about the ties of kinship. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he says about the ties of kinship, that he was once asked, 
um, who should I be good to? Who should I be good to? And so the Messenger of Allah replies, alayhi salatu wa salam, ummaka wa abaka, your mother, your father, wa ukhtaka wa akhaka, your sister and your brother, wa maulaka alladhi yaridak, and then your close relatives have the next right, have the closest, greatest right on you after this. Haqqun wajib, this is an essential duty. Wa rahimun mawsulatun, and a relationship that must be maintained. This is haqqun wajib, it is an essential duty. Wa rahimun mawsulatun, and a relationship <coughs> that must be maintained. So, our mother, our father, sister, brother, and then all our relatives that are close to us after that. And then as they get further and further away, the Messenger Allah said. And likewise, when it comes to uh, enjoying a ties or maintaining a ties of kinship, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, uh, tell me of a deed that will take me close to paradise, draw me to paradise, and distance me from the fire. And so the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam said, Ta'budullah, Ta'budullah, worship Allah. وَلَا تُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا without committing any shirk with him. وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ and establish the prayer. وَتُؤْتِ الزَّكَاةِ and give the zakat. وَتَسِلُ الرَّحْمِ and maintain the ties of kinship. And join the ties of kinship. This is, these are the deeds that will draw us closer to Jannah and away from the hellfire. Uh, and when it comes to the ties of kinship, as I said, there's, um, there's actually a general and specific as well as mentioned. The specific is what we're talking about here. Our parents, our cousins, our relatives, etc. But there's a general as well. And that general ties of kinship is the brotherhood of Islam, the sisterhood of Islam. And there's a duty we have towards the brotherhood as a whole, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as a whole. And, and that falls under the general category of maintaining a ties of kinship. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the rights of one Muslim over another Muslim are six. If you meet him, greet him with a salam. If he invites you, accept the invitation. If he asks for advice, give him advice. If he sneezes and praises Allah, then say, Yerhamukallah, respond to that. Um, and then respond to that, uh, that statement. If he falls sick, visit him. And if he dies, follow his funeral or attend his funeral. So these are, the, these are like the general duties we have uh, as a general sense. Maintaining a tie of kinship in a general sense, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And in the coming session, we'll talk about the specific duties we have towards our parents and towards our uh, our relatives as a whole. Do we have any questions before we stop for today?